Uh, so our next uh, speaker is Dr. Kropsky from Vanderbilt University. Uh, he's going to be talking to us about genetics of ILD. Good, uh, good morning to every. That was loud. Sorry. Good morning to uh, to everyone, and and thank you for being here. Um, I uh, I'm gonna try to figure out how to get this get this to work. There we go. Um, so these are my disclosures. Um, so what I, uh, what I would like to do over the next 25 minutes or thereabouts is, is one, give a little bit of a summary, um, not really of the entirety of what's known about genetics of, of interstitial lung disease, but really focus um, a lot on what we've learned over the last number of years and um, emphasize where, how I think that we need to be using this information, thinking about the future. And, and these, these first two talks, I think, have really set up this, um, this really ideally. Um, I, I want to... Um, echo the sentiments that have come from um, the last two speakers that, um, you know, 2019 has been a year of real progress and, and sort of the recognition that we now have promise of effective therapies in the vast majority of patients with pulmonary fibrosis. But I also want to emphasize that um, we, we shouldn't, um, we should resist the urge for progress to breed complacency among us, and we, we should resist the urge for, com for, for the fact that there is something to treat people with. Um, that, that shouldn't confuse us into thinking that all pulmonary fibrosis patients are alike, because we all know that they're not. But um, I, I think that there's, there's tendency for that to happen, and I, um, I really want to emphasize that um, one of the things that has become really clear over the last number of years is that um, genetic factors seem to be associated with similar disease risk across a spectrum of different interstitial lung disease phenotypes. And so I'm using the phrase interstitial lung disease phenotypes relatively um, carefully in that um, I think that the way we have classified all of these as different diseases over time probably misses important information about conserved and, and disparate mechanisms. And so I'd like to talk about that a little bit with, uh, with you all. Um, our, our current understanding and the current model of what causes diffuse lung diseases generally focuses on this notion that there's injury to the lung epithelium, and that injury and associated dysfunction activates fibroblasts, and that culminates in fibrosis. And so we have now two effect, uh, sorry, I'm not going to be able to go back, two effective therapies for, um, for pulmonary fibrosis, but these, okay, there we go. Sorry. There's the light. Um, but both of these effective therapies really focus on, on sort of these end stage downstream mechanisms of disease. And I think what we've, what we've heard is that there's likely multiple different upstream pathways that lead to this same um, sort of end stage pathology, and that there's real opportunity to target these more upstream disease mechanisms. And so um, there, there are a tremendous number of unanswered questions, though. So first, what are um, the sources of epithelial injury and dysfunction in most patients? Two, what really determines risk for, for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis? And then three, what are the determinants of, of these disparate ILD phenotypes and outcomes that we've seen? And, and I think environmental factors clearly play a role, and, and I'd, I'd like to talk about how genes do as well. So, so why should we care about this? Um, so heritable factors really dominate risk. For, for pulmonary fibrosis. Um, the, there, there have been multiple groups that have shown this. I'm just quoting data from, from Moises Selman and uh, his paper in, in 2010 that showed that, that among IPF patients, if you have a family history, you're, uh, you're at least at six-fold increased risk above the general population. So heritable factors are, without question, the strongest single risk factor, more than smoking, more than any of the environmental factors that we've been shown. And so genetic risk has really been studied in three different contexts. First, aggregation of disease in families, and this is a syndrome that we call familial interstitial pneumonia or uh, familial pulmonary fibrosis. Second, it's been studied in patients who don't have any known family history of disease, and, and that, that we, we call sporadic interstitial lung disease. 
And then I'm not going to talk about this today, but I just want to emphasize that there are other multi-system diseases and, and syndromes that are associated with fibrotic interstitial lung diseases. And, and these include things like hermansky pudlak syndrome, dyskeratosis congenita, and there are also some other autoimmune-related syndromes that have been associated with, with mutations in Sting and COPA and other things that um, are associated with these auto-inflammatory conditions that can lead to, to fibrotic interstitial lung disease, um, but tend to present more in, in pediatric populations. Um, so we, we've been interested in, in trying to um, learn from families with disease and, um, and, and have set up a, a large prospective cohort study that we've called the Early IPF Study. So this is a longitudinal, longitudinal prospective cohort of people who have 50% shared genes with somebody who has a familial case of interstitial lung disease. So siblings and children, 40 to 70, and they can't have known interstitial lung disease. And what we've, what we've had them do is, is a high-resolution CT scan, get blood, we've, we did bronchoscopies and, and BALs and transbronchial biopsies and 100 of these and, and get pulmonary function tests and check in with them every year and, and repeat this so over the course of every five years. And, and so the real question and, and the objective of, of this cohort is to understand you know, what, what is the natural history of, of disease in families with, um, with pulmonary fibrosis? And what we've learned so far is quite striking. Um, so among these asymptomatic family members, almost a quarter of them have interstitial changes on, on their baseline CT scan. Um, so this is, this is way beyond the prevalence that you see in um, sort of general populations where, and in other groups that have studied um, the Framingham cohort and Mesa cohort and, and sort of large population-based cohorts. So I think that this, this underscores that burden of genetic risk really has, has a huge influence on someone's um, likelihood for developing pulmonary fibrosis. Um, I didn't put a slide about this, but Margaret has a poster um, this, uh, this afternoon at the poster session that's going to talk about environmental exposures in these individuals, and I'd encourage you to, to stop by and, and check that out. I'm really struggling with this, sorry guys. <laughs> um, okay, so what confers genetic risk for pulmonary fibrosis? So, so when we talk about genetic risk, there are really two primary different mechanisms of genetic risk, and these are related to the frequency or how commonly you find that particular variant in the gene sequence. So rare genetic variants are, are things that are found uncommonly, and there are different thresholds that different groups use, but broadly speaking, these are things that you don't find in the general population in more than, say, one in a thousand people. These are very rare sequence changes. They tend to confer a very large impact on someone's risk for a given disease. Um, and they usually, although not absolutely always, they usually alter the protein structure. So they either lead to a, a, a absence of functional protein or dysfunction of, of that protein. Um, in contrast, common genetic variants are things that, that do have um, some frequency in, in the general population. They're found in more than 5% of healthy individuals. And the, the amount that they influence an individual's risk for disease is more on the order of a 10 to 50% increased risk for disease in, in most settings. And uh, an important point about what's different about these is that most of these common genetic variants that have been linked to all human disease don't tend to alter the protein structure. They're located in regions of the genome that are believed to affect gene regulation primarily as opposed to the actual structure of the protein. There are different techniques and technologies that we can use to analyze these things, and rare genetic variants tend to be, um, have gone through several different ages using candidate-based gene sequencing approaches and linkage studies and, and next-generation sequencing um, platforms more recently. And, and so these are, are, are the, the foundation of performing family-based studies and rare variant association studies to find rare mutations in families that are associated with high risk of disease. In contrast, these common genetic variants you can find through SNP genotyping or genotyping arrays, or more recently, there are these ultra low pass sequencing platforms. Um, and, and so this is, this is the kind of data that go into genome-wide association studies. So you wouldn't find these by doing these, and, and you probably don't have enough people doing these sorts of studies to implicate these variants. So we approach these differently for genetic discovery approaches. Okay, 
So, so what about families with disease? So multiple different groups have now reported that it, with careful ascertainment, at least 20% of IPF patients have a relative with interstitial lung disease. And um, I think a really important point to emphasize is, is um, that you can observe different histological and radiologic disease patterns within a family. So Mark Steele had, I think, a real seminal publication on this in 2005 that suggested that 50% of families have, have discordant imaging or radiologic disease phenotypes. Um, that has to tell us something about how gene-gene and gene-environment interactions play into this, and, and we need to do more work to understand that. Um, additionally, the vast majority of families exhibit an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern with incomplete penetrance. So that, that means a single copy of a mutated gene is sufficient to cause disease, but not everybody with that mutation will get disease. Um, there have been very rare cases of, of X-linked disease, so people, so men inheriting a, a uh, mutation in a gene that's on the X chromosome from their, their mother. These have been quite rare, and there are a handful of cases where, where two copies of a mutated uh, gene have been linked to disease risk. But broadly speaking, most of these families, um, most families with disease exhibit this pattern of, uh, of disease. So through the course of, of now about the last 15, 18 years, candidate gene studies have implicated mutations in genes related to surfactant biology and, and telomerase. Um, I also want to note that it was actually a family study um, uh, a family linkage study that first led to the association of, of a promoter polymorphism in, in this, this uh, airway mucin MUC5B um, with pulmonary fibrosis. And then more recently, next generation sequencing studies have implicated mutations in several other genes, all related to telomere biology as, as, as uh, central to FIP risk. So here's summary. These are data from, from both our cohort and assimilating from the literature. And, and what, we've, what we can see is that we, we can now attribute a culprit mutation to a, gene, to a known FIP gene in about 25% of families. <coughs> Excuse me, mutations in, in the telomerase enzyme are the most common. RTEL1 mutations are, are likely next common. TERK, PARN, Dyscarin, and these other genes are all, are all quite rare, but, but important for those families. And we anticipate that, that this is how we're going to, to see things evolve as we go forward, is many genes that, that have relatively private mutations in a very small number of families that, that drive disease risk. And so, admittedly, that has made this challenging to study. Um, and, and so there are numerous groups that are working on, on, on trying to push these problems forward. D so does this, does this matter to how people do? Um, so, so it appears that, that it does. So these are, again, data from, from our, our cohort studying um, 210 individuals from families with telomere pathway mutations versus other familial patients and, and compared to a, a cohort of sporadic IPF patients. And, and what we've seen is that if you have a mutation in one of these telomere genes, you tend to develop disease five or eight years earlier than, than someone who, who doesn't have one of these mutations. And, and perhaps not surprisingly then, these, these individuals who develop disease somewhat earlier, they, they have more rapid decline in, in lung function. So they lose lung function um, somewhat faster than those who don't have known telomere pathway mutations. And um, compared to those who, who don't have telomere pathway mutations, um, it, it appears that these mutations are associated with shorter transplant-free survival, and, and this is adjusting for age and adjusting for relevant pulmonary function tests and, and other genetic confounders. So we believe that, these, that this genetic information does provide important insight into disease natural history in, in these individuals. Um, the other thing that, that I think is, is really striking about this, and these are data from, from Christine Garcia's group, that that really say that, that your genetic diagnosis um, is what drives someone's outcome. So, it, it, and in this case, these are studies of, of different mutations in different telomere pathway genes where, where outcomes were similar regardless of, of which gene was mutated. 
And perhaps even more strikingly, whether you had a UIP IPF pattern or not, it didn't really matter. People had similar outcomes. And so, so what this suggested is that um, there may be multiple different second hits that, that if you have the wrong genetic um, susceptibility, um, that's what's going to primarily drive someone's disease course and disease phenotype. Okay, what about, what about genetic risk in patients who, who don't have a known family history? So the, the most, um, I think, emphasized and, and the strongest genetic risk factor in patients without a family history is this promoter polymorphism in, in an airway mucin, this, this gene MUC5b. And, and this is one of the most unusual genetic associations um, in human disease. The, the risk allele for this gene is found in, in 18 to 20% of people of European ancestry broadly. However, if you have one of these risk copies, you're, you're somewhere from six to eight times more likely to develop pulmonary fibrosis. And if you have two copies, it's up to 20 times more likely. So this is a very large effect on disease risk for a, a common genetic variant, one of the, the largest that is, has been recognized in, in human diseases. And what's perhaps even more puzzling about this is that while that um, risk genotype, so that's the T allele, is the one that confers disease risk. If you have that T allele, um, over time, it, it appears that you actually have somewhat slower disease progression and, and better survival. And so this is, this is sort of been a real puzzling paradox to the, the community over the course of, of the last five or six years as to why a strong genetic risk factor would be associated with better outcomes in, in patients. Okay, so, so let's, let's then say, well, do, do the genes that have rare mutations in them in families, do, do you also find mutations in those in people who don't have an obvious family history? And the answer to that is yes. And so these are data from the group at Columbia that showed that, that you find mutations in, in telomere-related genes, rare mutations in telomere-related genes, far more likely in sporadic IPA patients than you would expect by chance. And so then, then well, what, what does this tell us? And so this was a really clever study that um, Joe Aaron, Brian Yaspin, and Aaron, Amy Dressen, the, the folks at Genentech, took on analyzing um, whole genome sequencing data from um, patients who were involved in some of the perfenidone clinical trials and some clinical cohorts from a few academic centers. And, and what they did was look and see if you had the MUC5B risk variant or not, um, what, what, was, what were differences among these groups? And what they found was that telomere pathway mutations were specifically enriched in individuals who didn't have the MUC5B risk genotype. And in people who did have the MUC5B risk genotype, there wasn't an excess of these telomere pathway mutations. And so we've gone back and looked at this in our familial cohorts and found really the exact same thing. And so what, what that really suggests to us now is that there are genetically distinct subtypes of, of pulmonary fibrosis. And, and I think this really begins to show where precision medicine can start to integrate into, into this disease. So, Short telomere-associated disease tends to present somewhat earlier. MUC5B-associated disease tends to present somewhat later, and, and their disease natural histories are, are a little bit different. So does this, so do any of these genetic factors influence how people are going to do in the long run? So, so that also appears to be true. And so this is uh, more data from that same Lancet Respiratory Medicine paper last year. Um, and, and this was looking at whether there were differences in, um, in outcomes in, in the, uh, the perfenidone clinical trials based on, on MUC5B genotype. So people who don't have the MUC5B uh, risk genotype are in green, and, and those who do are in red, and I apologize to colorblind people. Um, this, I should have changed the colors. Uh, but uh, what, what you can see here is that um, while, while patients who didn't have the MUC5B risk allele, they, they still did better, so solid lines, or that uh, solid lines are placebo, dotted lines are perfenidone. They, they still did better. Um, the, ef the effect size was almost twice as big in people who did have the risk genotype. And so I, I don't have a reason as to why this would be the case, um, but it does suggest that there's, there's an interaction between genetic disease phenotype and, and treatment response. And, and perhaps we shouldn't have been surprised by this. Um, 
because um, you know, Justin Olden and Imre Noth had, had already showed something similar to this, analyzing um, the, the panther trial, where, where they had shown that individuals who have a particular polymorphism in the tollup locus do better um, on N-acetylcysteine than, than uh, on placebo, whereas if you had the other genotype, you would do worse. And, and so what, what they um, have, have hypothesized is that sort of this genetic heterogeneity of treatment effect kind of washed out signal. And, and, and so this is um, the foundation of, of the precision study that I'm sure you'll hear talked about somewhat significantly uh, by uh, Dr. Noth and Dr. Martinez during this meeting. Okay, so um, this has been touched on very briefly, but what about genetic risk in other ILD phenotypes? Okay, so these are data from, uh, from a French group that uh, were analyzing patients with rheumatoid arthritis associated with interstitial lung disease. Um, I feel like I'm, I'm beating a dead horse to some degree, but, but same message. So patients with rheumatoid arthritis and interstitial lung disease had an excess of telomere pathway mutations um, compared to patients who, who uh, to, compared to control patients. And, and these are, are data on the right-hand side of the screen from, from again, our cohort and, and others have shown similarly, again, you see different disease phenotypes even in patients who have known genetic risk. And, and in, you know, in these data, at least 17% of telomere pathway mutations have non-UIP IPF phenotypes. <laughs> And uh, this, this same slide um, uh, has, has already been up here earlier, but this was, these were data from um, the, the UT Southwestern and UCSF groups studying um, patients with, with hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And what they found was that the allele frequencies of, of this MUT5B risk polymorphism are exactly the same in these patients as they are in IPF. Um, and, and, and then more recently, last year, there was a study in rheumatoid arthritis associated ILD, and, and it's, it's the same thing. If you have UIP pattern, um, the MUC5B promoter polymorphism is, is just as prevalent as it is in, in IPF patients. Okay, and, and even more recently, these are data from, from a paper that Brett Lay just published looking for telomere pathway rare variants in patients with hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And first, they found that about 10, 12% of these patients carry these variants, and consistent to what's been seen in sporadic IPF patients, it appears that, that there really are distinct outcomes where these variants are associated with higher risk of more rapid disease progression. Okay, so, so to summarize all of that, rare variants in telomere biology genes are really found in somewhere between 15 and 25 percent of ILD patients, and that's quite agnostic of disease phenotype. Second, um, common variant genetic loci seem to confer similar disease risk regardless of family history, and so that suggests that the genetic background really of familial and sporadic forms of, of at least IPF are, are really much more similar than they are different. Um, and, and that this MUC5B promoter polymorphism has been associated with a variety of different ILD phenotypes, but not all of them. It's not been it, it, it's been looked at in systemic sclerosis, and that's different. And, and I think that we've really got increasing data that suggests genetic risk factors, predict disease outcomes, and potentially um, therapy response. And so I think these information um, need to be integrated as we go forward into thinking about future clinical trials and things like that. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this because there's a little other opportunity that, that we'll have later, but a question that then naturally comes up is, is about genetic testing. And this is, this is a question that Lisa addressed to some degree earlier. I think that there's a lot of practice variation um, as to what goes on on this front. And um, with support from the PFF, uh, Janet Talbert and I have been leading a group that's trying to put together um, information for PFF care centers, for community providers, for patients. To, to sort of under, really get an in-depth understanding of the considerations around genetic testing um, in, in patients and families with, with pulmonary fibrosis. Okay, what has what what studying all of this taught us about disease mechanisms? Okay, so, so we've learned a few things. First, our first genetic associations with disease were, were mutations in surfactant proteins. So, so what we've learned over time is that these surfactant protein mutations lead to misfolding of, of this protein. So it's highly processed, and it gets stuck in the endoplasmic reticulum when it doesn't fold, right? And that triggers what's called an unfolded protein response, and that activates a variety of different downstream transcription factors that can promote apoptosis and other things. And so 
we and, and multiple other groups have shown that activation of the UPR is common, not just in patients with surfactant mutations, but this is actually quite common across um, sporadic patients with, with IPF, and have, have used a variety of different mouse models showing that activation of this pathway increases fibrotic susceptibility in experimental models. Um, I just want to highlight a really interesting new, new study from Jeremy Katz and Mike Beers at, at Penn using a sort of a new genetic mouse model of, of some of these Brycos domain mutations that these are mice that express a mutation that will develop spontaneous inflammation and fibrosis, um, which I think is providing a, 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 provides a real new paradigm as to how we can begin to think about and test therapies directed at this pathway. Okay, so surfactant mutations are rare, but MUC5B is common. Well, it turns out um, in this really uh, uh, beautiful paper from, from Rick Boucher's group earlier this year, what they showed is that this ER stress activated transcription factor, XBP1, it specifically binds to the MUC5B risk, to, to the part of the promoter of MUC5B where the risk allele is and, activate, and has a differential activation of that promoter depending on your allele status. So, so what this suggests is that if you start to activate these ER stress pathways in patients who have this susceptibility allele, they'll make more mucus than, than other patients. And I think this is starting to give us insight into how that particular um, gene might work. Okay, what about telomere pathway things? There have been a lot of work using different mouse and other models trying to study telomere pathway mutations. And, and to summarize all of this up, I, I think what, what has become clear is that if you activate short telomeres can activate a DNA damage response and induce senescence and downstream signaling in, in type 2 cells and in the lung epithelium. And this has really now been shown in several different animal and other preclinical models as, as an important mechanism. So both of these pathways are now being actively pursued by multiple companies as new therapeutic targets. And I'm excited about this because I think this really could complement these downstream um, collagen and matrix production directed therapies um, that are already approved and, and others in the works. So, so I think combination therapy based on, on sort of these genetically informed mechanisms is the future. Okay, in the last just two minutes, I'd, I'd like to, to, to talk a little bit about how we're going to start to get at understanding some of these other mechanisms of, of genetic risk that we've not really um, made progress on yet. And, and so I think uh, a real opportunity is, is are these emerging single cell technologies that allow us to really more granularly understand the disease biology and disease lung. So this sort of work has been going on at multiple groups and I just wanna highlight an example of, of where and how this might be exciting. So these are, these are data that our group have, have posted on BioArchive now um, just a, a couple of weeks ago studying 30 different pulmonary fibrosis lungs and, and uh, or 20 pulmonary fibrosis tank control lungs and, and, and laid out sort of the single cell landscape of what we see in pulmonary fibrosis. And it's identified a variety of, of previously not well understood, characterized, or recognized states in the lung epithelium, including um, this, this mythical EMT cell um, that, that is defined by a particular uh, group of cytokeratins, and it's an epithelial cell that expresses collagen and other extracellular matrix components, um, and it is intimately associated with, with these areas of very high active collagen expression. So, in red is collagen, in white is keratin-17, a marker of these cells. And so, so these cells are, are the ones that are overlying these areas of active um, collagen expression. So it, it turns out that, um, that by, by doing this, you can start to look really granularly at the cell types that are influenced by these different, for example, IPF GWAS loci. And so on the top showed ACAP13. This is related to TGF-beta activation, and, and you can see that it is um, sort of surprisingly down, down regulated in, in some of these distal secretory cells and, and proliferating cells and in the alveolar epithelium, whereas this, um, this, this desmoplakin, which is another variant, is really most highly expressed in, in these keratin-17, these pro-fibrotic epithelial cells, and is, is relatively increased in, in patients compared to controls. And it, it provides some, some internal sort of proof of concept validity that in these secretory cells that express MUC5B, MUC5B gene expression is really much higher in IPF patients compared to controls, which I think really fits based on what we, we just talked about um, as to how that, that promoter polymorphism works.
Um, so, so to summarize, um, I think that studying families with ILD really provides unique opportunities to understand early disease mechanisms. I think it's quite clear that there are multiple discrete genetic risk mechanisms. There are sort of distinct ILD phenotypes. These genetic discovery approaches have, have really led to promising new targets focused on epithelial repair and regeneration. And I think that we're going to learn a lot more as we, as we get deeper into understanding sort of the, the lung at, at single cell resolution. Um, so this is, this is where I hope we are. Um, maybe, you know, hopefully next time the PFF summit happens, instead of talking just about pathology, we're also talking about how we really are grouping patients based on, on sort of genomic endotypes um, to be able to apply new and more precise therapies. Um, so with that, I am um, happy to stop and take questions or, or talk afterwards.